Our co-hosts on the day, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Bill? Good morning, Rob. It's a wonderful day in Rob's neighborhood. It is my neighborhood. It is your neighborhood, yes. Yeah, I, which I don't mind except when the tax bill comes. Yeah. And then it's a lot of property to claim. Also, let's welcome back uh, Maria Lawrence and Maria. Good morning. Good to be here. We have, this is always interesting, we have the two of you here because this is your... Like doppelganger right here, yeah. Teresa McCain. <laughs> what did you call me? Yeah. <laughs> doppelganger. Whatever it is, take exception. We don't. Right? Okay. <laughs> we don't look alike, but but you're you're like the same people. Yeah. Right. Do I don't we know. We both do it... marketing and fundraising. Yeah, that's is that right. what you're trying to say? In healthcare, she's that's hospice. Right. Well, it's not that just that you do it. That the two of you are, you know, like the apex predators of your trade, <laughs> oh, your individual wow. industry. They're the apex queen. predators. Yeah. They're both the queen bees of our community. There yeah, you go. They're, they're there just, you go. Uh, well, icons of the uh, of the local executive offices community. <laughs> well, okay, we will not tell them how long we've been. <laughs> I, well, I was just <laughs> going to okay, say go it's probably thirty years yeah. that we've worked yes. together on a lot of projects mm-hmm. in the nonprofit community. We chaired United Way Maria Day of Caring. Maria and I started yeah. Day of Caring in Jefferson yes, County. Yes, we did. We, we, we were the inaugural Day of yeah. Caring co-hosts in Jefferson mm-hmm. County. So This yeah. is why I say that you're, you're the dog. It's not dog tooting dog. our own horns or anything. Yeah, yeah. a lot of years, a yes, lot of years. Yes. There's a lot going on. But there. a lot of friendship, too. Absolutely. So. And yes. now you're Great. both in the health system. That's right. Right. Uh, speaking of which, we want to welcome in Albert Wright. He is the president and CEO of WVU Health Systems. Albert, good morning to you. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. And I wish I was out there in studio with you. Sounds like you guys are having a lot of fun. <laughs> we, we have a female power couple here. We do have. And you and I just standing back to watching them in action. Basking They're in dynamic. their gloves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Teresa, tell us a little bit about Mr. Wright. Well, Albert, uh, as you said, is the president and CEO mm-hmm. of um, West Virginia University Health System. Um, so he is our boss. Um, he's over the entire uh, WV medicine system in West Virginia, which is the largest health system, of course. Uh, and not just West Virginia. We have hospitals in Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, and Ohio. So mm-hmm. yes. I did not realize that. They're mm-hmm. called West Virginia University Health Center. What are, the, what are they called in Ohio? Well, let's let Albert talk about that. Okay. Sure. Yeah, Since no, happy to. No, we, we, we brand all of our hospitals as WVU Medicine, and we have, as Teresa shared, we have uh, hospitals in border counties in Garrett County, Maryland, in Fayette County, Pennsylvania, and then we've got a hospital each in Belmont County and Harrison County, Ohio, and they're, um, they relate very well to our brand and the, and the health system, and a lot of those folks seek care um, not only locally, but higher level care sometimes in uh, Morgantown. Uh, Mr. Wright, I know there's a few things that you want to address regarding your ORs, and I want to give you ample time to do that. If you'd like to go ahead and take that and run with it now, go right ahead, sir. Yeah, no, we had a we had an incident, as, as I think uh, you probably are aware, and we've been trying to share, where we've got some construction happening on the Berkeley Medical Center campus, and it's a complicated project where we're actually – adding additional floors on top of existing um, existing infrastructure. And we had a, a breach as we were adding a floor above the operating room. So we had a, a pretty significant flood a couple weeks back that we've had to respond to. And as you can imagine, operating rooms are your, your most critical areas to have, you know, environmentally safe and clean and, and hazard-free. So we we had a construction breach, and we had to shut down our 10 operating rooms at Berkeley Medical Center. And our teams, both locally in the eastern panhandle there in Berkeley and Jefferson counties, and then we got some support folks on site from Morgantown out working with the teams out east. We've been able to successfully shut those ORs down and start the the demolition and reconstruction process. And our teams have done a spectacular job out east to kind of redirect surgeries to other parts of Berkeley Medical Center proper, Uh, other parts of we have a great ambulatory surgery center on the Berkeley Medicine campus that we're we're moving some of the surgeries that we usually do in the hospitals to the surgery center. Then, of course, we've got Jefferson Medical Center down in Jefferson County that are, are taking on some of those surgeries now as well. So we're working some longer days, maybe some weekends, but the the teams come together and are, are making the best out of a difficult situation. Were you able to investigate it properly to find out specifically what happened? 
Yeah, there's, we're working with the, we have both internal construction teams, but we're working on a, on a, with a external contractor as well. And there was just a, a mishap where a certain area of the, the floor was open as they were adding on and it wasn't appropriately sealed up before the weekend. And that's where the, uh, the breach occurred. Does the cost of uh, remediation for this fall upon the hospital or the contractor? You know, I think we're going to work through all those things in the coming weeks. Right now, we're 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 more focused on how do we get things back up and running, and we'll sort out the the who who's responsible for what down the road. And in regards to patients and any effects on patients, has that been evaluated? Patients always come first, and we've we're making sure that we're getting folks prioritizing and triaging and getting folks that need surgery done the quickest. You know, in um, in one of our existing facilities, or we may have to move them to another facility. But so far, patient care is, has not been interrupted in any way, shape, or form. Maria? Uh, good morning, Albert. Nice to have you with us. Um, Thanks, so the, the million-dollar question, how long do you think um, it will take to remediate the problem, and, um, and when can we expect to see ORs up and running again, the, the current, the ones that were... Um, yeah. impacted at the, uh, the main... were affected. Right. No, that's a great question and that that timeline gets refined a little bit each more as we as we go through our demolition and and we put our reconstruction plans together, but you're probably looking at a uh, two two and a half month process at this point from the best we can tell that uh, you know, I I add the caveat that we're still figuring out exactly what we're going to have to redo and rebuild, but you're probably talking about a two, two and a half month time frame. And you're able then to um, to mitigate some of the time frame there by um, moving folks out, determining what's um, yeah. you know what's critical to do on campus because I guess you're still doing surgeries kind of across the street. Is that yeah? Yeah. Okay. We're doing some surgeries across the street in the medical office building there. And what we're looking at is, is there a way we'll probably bring those 10 operating rooms that are down right now, we'll probably bring those back up in phases. So we're looking, can we compartmentalize and, and get four or five back up and running in a quicker time frame and then, then get these second ones um, done a little bit after that. And like anything, you know, just kind of like if you've ever had a, a flood in your home or anything, Sometimes you take time to renovate on things you wanted to do anyways, but it never got around to. So there are some enhancements we're looking at as part of this process. Funny you would say that, Albert, because this morning I have roofers. While I was getting ready, um, we had a leak in a roof and just a portion of the roof, and it was just time to do the whole doggone thing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, they're loud up there. So anyway. (laughs) It's a good analogy. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Uh, Good morning, Albert. Uh, The the center of excellence for the in the state is, is is in Morgantown. Uh, what type of operations are limited to Morgantown or can be done in other parts of the state? What do you mean, Bill? I don't what? really know what I mean by that. I, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I get the impression there is some, uh, there's a level of sophisticated level of treatment that's available in Morgantown. I hear occasionally that gotcha. someone has to leave, go from Berkeley yeah. County to Morgantown. There, so I'm just. That's a good question. Yeah. There are certain things that we call, you know, high level tertiary or quaternary care. And they're, they're usually very subspecialized procedures that are that are low volume, but if you do them in one place, even though they're, they're low volume in the total population, if you do them in one place, they become regular for you. So for example, you know, we only do heart transplantation or kidney transplantation, bone marrow transplants, and or you know, pediatric surgeries like pediatric heart surgery. We only do those things in Morgantown, and we have this interconnected web of hospitals, which includes Berkeley and Jefferson that, you know, can feed patients seamlessly from other parts of the state here to Morgantown, you know, for those higher levels of care. Now, with that said, you know, and in the last decade, we've grown a lot as a healthcare system all around the state where, you know, I came 10 years ago, and I think we had six hospitals in the healthcare system at that time. We will, at the end of this year, have 25 hospitals in the WVU Medicine healthcare system. So we've grown a lot in mergers and acquisitions around the state. I think our next decade, though, 
is going to be very focused on growing breadth and depth at our existing hospitals. And the Eastern Panhandle is at the top of that list. So our hope in the next year is to announce that we'll build an additional um, healthcare tower on the Berkeley Medical Center campus and significantly increase the size and scope of that campus. And then to your to your point, Bill, you know, we want to be able to do as much care as possible close to home, right? So how do we start to add services at Berkeley Medical Center, you know, things that we don't have today? And we've talked about things like, you know, interventional stroke care. We talked to things about things like open heart surgeries in that part of the state. You're a growing part of the state. And we have one of our medical school campuses there and in Berkeley and Jefferson County are shining stars. So we want to grow our capabilities in uh, around the state and especially in the Eastern Panhandle. Thanks for giving a very complete, thoughtful answer to a very confused question. So, <laughs> so <thank you. laughs> yeah. uh, competition to bring uh, doctors and skilled uh, practitioners uh, uh, is tough among all all areas. How competitive is WVU in getting the top of the line practitioners? You know, I think we're exceptionally competitive. I, you know, sometimes I'll hear people say, oh, geez, it's hard to recruit to West Virginia. And we have not found that at all. I have not found that to be the case at all. I think if you put the right people, programs, physical plant facilities together, I think we're a very attractive healthcare system. I think there's a a wonderful quality of life here in West Virginia, and we've been able to recruit doctors, you know, uh, you know, whenever we've needed to, we we can get the talent here, whether we produce it ourselves through our our medical schools or whether we, you know, are recruiting externally. In certain parts of the state, you know, Morgantown is a is a great college town. The Eastern Panhandle, with your your natural beauty and your proximity to Washington, the Greater Washington D.C. area. These are areas that we're able to recruit um, great doctors to. The 60 Minutes that we had uh, uh, several months ago that got such a, a high visibility, have you seen any direct impact from that series? Yeah, <laughs> we see about 1,000 phone calls a day, you know, because, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm half joking, but I'm not, because, you know, the, the two features that they really looked at in the 60 Minutes piece was Alzheimer's disease and addiction. And there is such a challenge. There are so many people that have loved ones with that are afflicted by those diseases, you know, whether it be Alzheimer's or we all know someone that suffers from addiction. And the challenge with both of those is hope in a lot of cases and, and what to do. So the 60 Minutes piece with Dr. Rezai and the, the entire team from the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute was really focused on, you know, innovative, non-invasive procedures that are showing you know, first in human trials that are showing great results. And a lot of people are excited about that possibility and, and, and you know, want that help now. So we've seen um, a lot of folks inquire about treatment here. We've had a lot of folks from all over the country and, and sometimes international patients coming to see us to, uh, to seek care. So it's been a, a great boost um, for the university and the state but it's also just, you know, provides hope for folks that have um, have very difficult disease states. So it's uh, it's a real point of pride for us at the university. I'm always curious the story behind the story. How did 60 Minutes become aware of the activity or the work of WV and Dr. Zai? You know, I'm not sure exactly how 60 Minutes became aware, but people have a, you know, people everywhere have a way of, figuring out when something special has happened. And and the work they're doing with the human operating system and and using focus ultrasound for neuromodulation at at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute is easily the most impressive physician scientist work I've seen in my 30-year career. And there's been increasing numbers of articles and and papers that have covered the work they're doing. We were on NBC News a few years ago, or a few, yeah, a year or two ago, and they had a big paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then 60 Minutes just kind of caught on. They came, They, I think they had three or four visits here. And so believe me, to even make it on 60 Minutes alone, let alone to get two segments, is material. So they do their homework and you know, I will tell you, when you meet Dr. Rezai and his team, they are very impressive folks, and, 
you know, I've had the the privilege of meeting some of the patients directly that they've taken care of and you know, it'll be interesting to see where this all goes, but it's it's special work that's being done over there. And if I remember that feature, they had done something on him while he was doing a different type of work at another university setting, if yeah. I remember. This was, yeah, more, this he was had, a follow-up. Uh, Dr. Rezai has been a, a leader in what's called neuromodulation um, and you know, for a long time, and it was kind of neat that they had looked at work he was doing at the Cleveland Clinic when he was at the Cleveland Clinic about 20 years ago where he was doing specific work with, with um, you know, basically deep brain stimulators at that point in time. And he's now evolved this work from where it's, where it's, you know, a deep brain stimulator is actually invasive where you're putting something in the brain. Now he's, he's having the same results and doing the same type of work with, with ultrasound, which is non-invasive, so it's not surgical. So, yeah, it's kind of kind of need to watch his progression as a physician scientist over the years. I know you have to go soon, so I know we, we do we have time for another question or two? Oh, absolutely. Okay, Maria, go right ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think what that speaks to is um, how important the research component is, not just... I mean, I think the average Joe thinks about, okay, I got to go to the hospital, I've got to do this, have this done, what have you. But, you know, research is such a big part of what you do at WVU Medicine, correct? Yeah, it, research is a big part of what we do at the, at the health system. And specifically, I'd like to share, you know, we really try to focus on what we call translation, translational research that is going to directly affect our patient population. You know, so I always... I always joke that I, you know, as the CEO of the health system, I need to be able to explain, you know, very easily to folks why we choose to make certain investments and do things. And when you think about that work that the Rockefeller Neuroscience team is doing, where they're actually, you know, intervening and and clearing plaques away, you know, in patients that have these plaque buildups in Alzheimer's disease or turning off the craving center in folks that are addicted. This is translational research that as West Virginians or any of those we serve in those other states that we talked about before is very easily to think about, geez, how can this help us to improve the health trajectory of the state of West Virginia? So, you know, research is important, but it's also important that we invest in things that are going to actually help our patient population. Uh, we have uh, Majority Leader Eric Householder on next in our, our uh, following segment here. Uh, Albert, how much does the reimbursement rate established by the legislature to medical systems like WVU affect what you charge and what you're able to do in the state? You know, it's it's very helpful, actually. And a few years ago, Eric and the rest of the legislature, with, along with the governor, actually improved our PEIA reimbursement rates that are very helpful. They've been very helpful in in helping us um, with our Medicaid rates and Medicaid reimbursements around the state as well. You know, we're um, we're a kind of a unique health system here in West Virginia where about 75% of our patients are governmental payors, which historically aren't the the greatest payers. You know, those improvements that they'd help us make keep our commercial rates down. And, you know, we're a nonprofit healthcare system, which means we're never going to, you know, have huge profits, but is it is important for us as a healthcare system to be able to maintain a two to three percent operating margin so that we can make, you know, reinvestments in our facilities and recruitments of doctors for reality. So Eric has been a, a great partner to us and the um and the legislature and the governor has helped us to be a, a successful, thriving rural health care system. And at a, in a time where a lot of rural facilities around the country are closing down, I'm very proud to say that, you know, we are a health care system that's growing and investing in our communities. Final word is yours, Albert Wright. Anything else you'd like to add? No, I just want to thank you for allowing me to have time here today. And I want to thank our our wonderful teams at WVU Medicine out in the Eastern Panhandle that are working around the clock to make a difficult situation better and make sure we're taking care of our patients, and I'm very proud of them and, and thankful. Thank you for your time this morning. Much Thank appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Albert Wright, Jr., CEO of WVU's Health Systems. Thank you, Teresa McKay, for helping to set that up as well. My pleasure.
uh, impressive. Very, uh, very I informative. Love, this is why we have him do interviews. Mm. He does an excellent yeah. job. Yes. Very, very much so. He's a great spokesperson for our health system, for sure. And as he said, the past 10 years since Albert has been here, because you know me, I've worked at the hospitals prior to even us being a part um, of WVU Hospitals in Morgantown, and he has really uh, been responsible for expanding um, our system into what it is today so he still describes himself as a rural health care system is that the way wvu views themselves or brands themselves i think it's more that west virginia is considered rural when you city. think of it a, a rural in state the scheme of things, in yeah. the scheme of things but certainly when you when you look at the things that we're doing, that I mean, we were talking about the the R and I, the Rockefeller yeah. Neuroscience, the, the things that Dr. Badwar is doing at the Heart and Vascular Institute, um, the Cancer Institute, some of our signature institutes, um, which we happen to have those three here um, here in in our in the Eastern Panhandle. But um, it, it just makes you very proud, as Albert said, to to work for this kind of system and the folks that we work with. Bill, you have yeah. to hang on to that okay, question yeah, yeah, because yeah. we're running out of time and Teresa needs to get us the golf information. I do. We had our 37th annual Bernie Hutzler Golf Classic on Monday um, at the club at Crest Creek. We had a 211 golfers. Over the years, we've estimated that we've raised nearly $2 million from this annual um, event, golfing event, which was established in 1988. Um, we were the first really um, fundraising golf tournament um, in the area so it's always the first Monday in June and I'm happy to say we had an $80,000 goal this year um, and we don't have exact dollars in yet but we know we exceeded that and we think that our net proceeds are between 87 well, I shouldn't say think because we just have to make sure we have all of our invoices in but it looks like 87,000 to 88,000 so dollars and that would be a record as I was saying earlier I think um, Diane Daly held the record when she was co-chair years ago <laughs> and I think uh, at that point we had netted 84 was was our was our record so now who's co-chair this year um co-chair this year was um a tr uh, rudy who works for our facilities department and matt stickler who works for bct so they'll carry so the crown going forward they will carry the crown um and actually the way we work that is it's a two-year commitment so matt will be back next year as a co-chair and then we, we we will appoint another internal uh, within our wvu medicine hospitals here um as a co-chair to work with matt so. and the 87,000 will go to what this year we have not determined yet we are looking at all of the needs i do know that we're going to purchase an ultrasound machine for the heart and vascular institute that i do know but uh, we still have um, other decisions to make that's great anything else to add to that teresa i don't think so i appreciate you having uh us on this morning and hopefully we can invite albert back when he can come in studio that'd be wonderful do you have anything else coming up this summer or in the fall that's another in the fall our next fundraiser is our pickleball tournament the mm -hmm. frank sabato jr pickleball classic and that will be held on september 14th at the randy smith center in inwood right, so have you opened up registrations for that yet? not yet so everybody hold on you're still wrapping up for golf oh, you but yeah which moved moved but, from but please it a many from a year tennis, tennis tournament and last yeah. year was our first year's pickleball and it was such a huge huge success sure. That's where um, so we're going to continue with pickleball pickleball it is teresa thanks so much for doing what you do absolutely thank you well done